like it to be, so please be careful on the way out especially. Uh, if you need some help, contact uh, one of us and we'll be glad to take the dive with you. <laughs> <laughs> no, just... <laughs> We'll, we'll, we'll make the landing. We'll make the landing soft. No, whatever. Be really be careful, or we can drive your car up or something. Whatever. So uh, draw your attention to the back of your bulletin uh, and the insert. Uh, the insert you can see our Wednesday evening uh, is in this Wednesday evening is Ash Wednesday. So our Ash Wednesday service is at seven o'clock. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think the parking lot will be much better by then. So uh, in darkness, be careful, especially that that evening as well. Um, and I would suggest going out this exit. I, I didn't go out this, I didn't, I came in, but I didn't notice on the way in what it was like, but I know I went out this way the other night, and it was, I, if there would have been a car coming, I wouldn't have made it. So, yeah, it, I, so if you think about it, if you think about it, go out the other direction, and it's much better uh, to get out. Um, as you can see on the back of your bulletin, uh, the What Next Task Group meeting is a uh, meeting on Tuesday night. Um, if you'd like to pick up the agenda and the uh, uh, mission statement examples that I sent out to you, I've got hard copies for you uh, in the office if you want to pick those up. Um, that's at 5 o'clock. Uh, the annual um, Maple Serve meeting next Sunday, the 26th at 11 at Peace. And then uh, you can see the path, Family Pathways announcement there for the donations uh, for this time of year. Are there other announcements or prayer concerns? Uh, you might have noticed uh, Jeff Rogers added to the prayer list. Jeff uh, didn't know exactly all of his health concerns, but he had some challenging health concerns for a bit. I uh, was hospitalized, now he's at home. I talked to him and he said he's doing much better. Thanks for the prayers and uh, he's sounding positive and good. So um, I, wasn't, I wasn't too concerned about it, but at the same time someone said it was pretty, pretty uh, um, challenging uh, for him for a while there. So lift up uh, those people in our prayers. Anybody else? Yes. It's just kind of um, long term to be honest, but um, you mentioned that President Jimmy Carter is in hospice now, at age 98. So uh, he's decided to be at home with his melanoma that's uh, a body. That President's Day weekend seems appropriate to think of all of them, but uh, Jimmy Carter, she said, was in the hospice. The other? If not, let's turn to our uh, bulletin and stand and join together in our confession and forgiveness as printed on page one of your bulletin there. <clears throat> Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who makes all things new, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Amen. Trusting in God's mercy, let us confess our sin. Holy One, source of our renewal, we confess that we are wrapped up in sin and cannot forgive ourselves. We have not practiced your righteousness. Our hearts have turned away from you. For the sake of the world you so love, forgive us that we may be reconciled to one another for the glory of your holy name. Amen. Thus says, the, uh, thus says our God, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. God's mercy makes us new. We are forgiven in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. We join in our opening hymn, Immortal, Invisible God, Only Wise, 834. 834.
fill the, uh, go ahead and come forward, Pointer. We're going to fill the Kyrie and the hymn of praise with our own uh, <coughs> song here. Uh, this is a holy day. Um, and then we'll pray our uh, prayer of the day following that. And then we've got another uh, hymn that we're going to sing. Glory.
fear and with trembling. This is the burning wind, and will perish in the way, for his wrath is for the kingdom. Happy are all who take refuge in him. Word of God, word of life. The second reading is from 2 Peter, first chapter 16 through 21. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. You will do well to be attentive to this as to the lamp shining in the dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in our hearts. First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation because no prophecy ever came by human will, but men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to Saint Matthew, the 17th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with them. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. There are so many ways to go with this transfiguration scene that we have before us here in Matthew, and it's hard for me to know exactly where to begin, so let's start at the beginning, as uh, Julie Andrews was saying, right? Start at the very beginning, right? So first off, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have this transfiguration story in their Gospels. All have a little different take on it to meet the uh, desire that they have to, to bring a message to their particular audience. The Gospel of John, however, has no transfiguration scene in it at all. He doesn't need it because he has Jesus come right out and say, of his own accord, I am the light of the world. <laughs> he doesn't need to have him light up like we see him here in the transfiguration. Anyway, here in Matthew, uh, it starts by indicating a very specific time, six days later which should prompt the question, why include that? What, what happened six days ago, right? Anytime you have a number in scripture, you should at least ask the question, can we find out an answer? Why this number, why is that included? Well, here we look and uh, we see that back a few chapters, uh, six days prior, Jesus has asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? They answered, well, some think you're John the Baptist, who's come back to life. Because remember, he, at this point, had been beheaded, or by this point had. 
And so they think you're John, come back to life. Or others think you're Elijah. Others think you're one of the great prophets. And the intimation there, the implication is that they're thinking of Moses. And Jesus comes then back with, but who do you say that I am? To which Peter immediately pipes up, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. That great feeling that Peter speaks is short-lived when Jesus continues and says that his path is to the cross and death. And Peter immediately says, never, that will never happen, Lord. To which Peter, Jesus says to him, get behind me, see, right? Remember that scene, okay. So that's the background that we need to understand as Jesus goes then up on this mountaintop with James and John and Peter uh, uh, to this scene. We need to put all of these tensions into the mix. Peter's insights as well as his short-sightedness along with the reality of the cross that Jesus has been talking about as well as the resurrection that is promised. Not only that, but there's a lot of history to consider, isn't there? We heard a lot of it in the text today. We heard that in the Exodus passage how Moses was up on the mountain, and it was only after six days that God spoke to him. So you can kind of picture all of this scrambling around in these disciples' head as they're going up this mountaintop. And then Jesus... Jesus is transfigured. He's turned dazzling white. And if that's not enough, Moses and Elijah appear. I've always wondered, how the heck did they know it was Moses and Elijah? Did they have name tags on? Did they look like their pictures in the basement of the sanctuary of the prophets of old? How, I, I have no idea. Anyway, why these two? Well, they represent, well, first of all, neither of them in Scripture actually said they died, right? Um, and the other thing is they represent the legal and prophetic tra traditions uh, of their past. But the interesting thing is that it's not, they, it's not them that God says listen to, it is to Jesus that they are to listen to. And that's not to say that Jesus is replacing Elijah and Moses, but more to emphasize that Jesus has come to fulfill their messages. Jesus is becoming the new voice of hope for a people in despair. So back to the scene at hand, there's Moses and Elijah that appear, and Peter, in very Peter-like fashion, jumps right in, and he wants to... He wants to do something, right? <laughs> he wants to do something. He's very impetuous. Now, I don't want to get down on Peter here by any means. Often Peter is made out to be impulsive and impetuous. Um, he speaks sometimes without thinking, acts without thinking. And in this instance, it's hard to know exactly what Peter was trying to do. Some think that he was just trying to make it comfortable for everyone, you know, kind of get them out of the sun, make these tents, these it would have, in their day would have called tabernacles to get them, make them more comfortable. Others think that he was trying to harness the events, you know, harness the, the wonder of it and, and kind of preserve the moment so that they could forever keep the power and glory that seemed to have appeared here on this mountaintop. Whatever Peter's motivation was, we don't know for sure, but in the very midst of that, God interrupts him, doesn't God? And he, God repeats the announcement that God made over Jesus at his baptism. We've talked a lot about that over the last few weeks. Where God proclaims, this is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Listen, listen to him. That line is again, we heard it in Psalm 2 as we shared it this morning earlier. It is a coronation psalm that... Uh, announces the authority and power of a king. So let's step back for a moment. So here we are on Transfiguration Sunday in our church here. It's kind of the last Sunday of Epiphany. And up until now, in a way, 
we've been continuing to open up the gift that came to us in Christmas, the gift of who Jesus is and the light that is continuing to be revealed to us and how it's been growing in intensity, heightened to a point that here Jesus is standing in a way before us, his light shining, or as I like to joke, the high pro glow is on it. Remember that commercial? The dog commercial. Anyway, I mean, you know, here Jesus is. The light is fulfilled. It is standing right there in front of us. And not only that, but we're back up a mountain, right? It's exactly the Jesus we want. Because it exudes joy. It exudes power and glory. And as the psalm highlights, it's a scene that Peter certainly can identify with. One that he wants to cling to it appears to and is connected to. And yet on the other hand, Transfiguration Sunday is the very beginning of Lent also, isn't it, in a way? And what's the end of Lent? Good Friday, right? And on Good Friday, where are we? We're on another mountain. Well, it's not much of a mountain, it's a hill, but we call it a mountain, it's Golgotha. And it's there that Jesus is nailed to a cross. It's there that darkness and death prevail, not light. It's there that Jesus himself echoes not Psalm 2 in coronation, but Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it's there that we get not the Jesus we want, the triumphant, glowing, powerful Jesus. But we get the very Jesus that we need. And it's this Jesus, this Jesus that God wants us to listen to. Now we could spend a great deal of time, and we have in the past a little bit talking about what is it that Jesus is saying to us and what should we be listening for in a way that's kind of what we as a congregation are doing right now, listening for what's next, right? But it's, there's some other parts of this text that are of more interest to me. After God speaks, it says that Peter, James, and John fell to the ground and they were overcome by fear. And then Jesus does something very important that I think often gets overlooked. It says that Jesus reached out and touched them. He touched them. This touch from Jesus is the very embodiment of Jesus' compassion that he has been sharing with all those people up till this point. All those people on the hillside that we've been studying the last few weeks in the Sermon on the Mount, those disenfranchised people, that touch is that healing touch that comes to the disciples as well. A touch that fills them with the courage and the ability to stand and to move forward. And with that, then Jesus speaks those important words, get up, get up and do not be afraid. And in that moment, the scene goes back to where it started, doesn't it? No prophets of old, they're gone. No voice booming from the heaven, no light shining from Jesus' face, it's gone. The world has gone back to where it was. Or has it? These disciples, I have to believe, <coughs> were changed. You and I have forever been changed. What we see now more clearly is that when all the spectacular light shows and mystical appearances are gone, when the mountaintop experiences fade, who's left? Who's left is Jesus. 
the very Jesus who gathered up his disciples after the darkness of his death and the wonder of his resurrection. It is this Jesus who will come again and stand with them and remind them that he will be with them always, always, even to the end of the age. And as comforting as that is, it serves only to highlight what we might call our marching orders, a mantra to live by, which are those words that Jesus said to them, get up, get up and do not be afraid. Yes, we need not be afraid because Jesus is victorious over all things, even, even death. We need not be afraid because Jesus is with us always, just like he promised to the disciples. And we know oh so well that the world needs us to get up, doesn't it? The world needs us to get up, to be the resurrection people that we are, to be the Easter people we are, to be the beloved, blessed children of God that we are. So let us both individually as well as collectively, as the body of Christ, let us get up and be not afraid. Let us live our lives in a bolder trust in God's work through our hands. May the joy and light of Jesus fill us, so much so that others around us say, I want that. I want that kind of hope, that kind of joy, that kind of faith, even in the midst of the challenges around us. I want that. I want to be a part of that. So let us get up. Let us get up and do not be afraid. Amen.
Apostles' Creed as found on page 5 of your bulletin. Together we both confess and profess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Called together to follow Jesus, we pray for the church, the world, and all we know to be in need. Let us pray. Lord, enroll in your church as it witnesses to the majesty and mercy of your Son. Equip lay pre preachers, deacons, and pastors. Move us to share our stories of your faithfulness and forgiveness. May our lives proclaim your greatness. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Lord, dwell with your holy, whole creation, from the tallest mountain peak to the deepest valley. Bless the work of conservation organizations and protect vital habitats. Support the work of disaster relief agencies around the world, especially now in Turkey and Syria. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Guide and give wisdom to all who are in authority, our local leaders, our state legislators and leaders, our presidents and national legislators. Bring freedom and justice to all nations. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Give shelter to those lacking safe homes, Spur communities to work for fair housing for all. Protect our neighbors whose dwellings do not keep out dangerous cold or heat. Accompany with your touch those who are homebound, sick, or isolated. We pray especially today for those that we've named before you, those on our prayer list, President, ex-President Carter. Uh, we lift them all to you as well as others we know to be in need as we pause in a moment of silence to share them with you. Grant them, Lord, your comfort and your peace. Merciful God, peace is our prayer. Make us eager to receive your word in scripture. Help us recognize Jesus' voice in the midst of our neighbors. Make us confident to follow the way of the cross. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Receive our thanksgiving for the holy ones who have guided us in faithfulness and gathered even the unlikely as your people. With our forebears in faith and all who have hoped in you, teach us to wait with courage until the promised day dawns. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We bring to you our needs and our hopes, trusting your wisdom, O oh God, that you may reveal to us the wonder of Christ crucified, in whose name we pray. Amen. Please stand as you are able as we join in the great thanksgiving on page 144, it's in the front portion of your hymnal. 144. <coughs> Thank you. 
we write our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who sharing our life lived among us to reveal your glory and love, that our darkness should give way to your own brilliant light. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their
body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Holy One, we thank you for the healing that springs forth abundantly from this table. Renew our strength to do justice, love kindness, and journey humbly with you. Amen. The God who faithfully brings forth justice and breaks the oppressor's rod, bless, strengthen, and uphold you today and always. Amen. We're sending him as 631 to all loves excelling. 631. <laughs>
Jesus. Thanks be to God.